Today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Exodus chapter 3. Today we're going to be talking about God encounter, right? God encounter. And in Exodus 3, we're going to be looking at the prophet Moses. This is when God encountered Moses for the first time. Let me give you a little bit of backstory if you don't know who Moses is. Or it's been a long time since you read about him. We're introduced to Moses somewhere in Exodus chapter 1, chapter 2. And what was going on at this time is the people of Israel, they left the promised land, the land that God had given them, Jacob, because of Joseph, and went to a land called Goshen, which is just north of Egypt, if you look on the map. And they were there for over 300 years. Now, God told Jacob, you're going to be there for 400 years, and I'm going to come rescue you. So they already knew that. But as they were in the land of Goshen, God blessed them. They began to grow and prosper. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had a problem with that because he thought these people were going to become too big for them. And then if there was a war, that they were going to side with the other people at the war. So he got a little anxious. So he made this rule. And this rule was that any Hebrew boy that was born, he was going to kill him. Right? He's going to kill him. Not only that, he increased their slavery and the work that they were doing. They were, they were building things for Pharaoh and for Egypt. And so he wanted to increase their labor. And so when that wasn't working, he said, all right, I've got to do something more. And that's when he's like, oh, we're going to kill all the Hebrew boys. And so after a series of events, that when the midwives wouldn't do it, and God continued to bless him, he goes, okay, just throw the Hebrew boys into the Nile River, right? Just throw them in there. And Exodus 2 tells us that there's this Levite woman and this Levite guy. They got married. They actually had two kids that we know of before Moses. But when they had Moses, it says that she looked at her baby and he was a beautiful baby. Now, I haven't met a mother that hasn't had a baby that didn't think their baby was the most beautiful baby, right? That's kind of odd to me. I, I'm not sure why that's in there, you know. Well, it, I think it's because we want that Moses is important. Now, I've seen some babies that, <laughs> that you just go, wow, I, I guess he looks after his dad or something. So, uh, you know, but uh, none of my kids, my kids are all the most beautiful kids in the world, right? right. Uh, so it was just an odd thing. But now Moses, um, so Moses, after three months, when she couldn't hide him any longer, she put him in a basket, put him in the Nile River, and left him up to God. Right? And just so happened that Pharaoh's daughter w- went down to the, to the Nile and sees this basket and asks one of the servants, hey, go get that basket. And when she goes and gets the basket, they open up and there's this Hebrew boy that's crying in the basket. So any kind-hearted human being was moved, right, to take that baby. So Pharaoh's daughter's like, well, I will keep this baby. I found this baby. She named him Moses because out of the water that she took him, right? But... This cool part is, is that, that Moses' daughter followed him to see what would happen to him. So when he sees that, that Pharaoh's daughter's got her brother, she's like, hey, let me go get a Hebrew woman that will come and nurse him and, and raise him a little. Get him and wean him a little is really the, the terminology. And she goes, okay, go do that. Now, to me, the miracle of the story of Moses is this is that Pharaoh's daughter told Moses' mom, you raise him and I will pay him, pay you to raise him. Now, if you're a parent, don't you wish you got paid to raise your kids? Wouldn't that make life easier? I have a teenager, and I got to tell you right now, as a, with a teenager, if somebody could give me some money, I'd feel much better because he won't stop eating and using electronics and using the air conditioner and using water. You know, it's just crazy. So when I read the story, I think, wow, how fortunate Moses' mom was. Well, Moses grew up uh, for, uh, had a couple years with his mom, um, might be towards the age of five, and Pharaoh's daughter comes back and gets him, and he ends up being raised in the, in really the palace and royalty. And he gets to be student, a student of the Egyptians, and he was taught really well. Well, then at the age of 40, or maybe it's 38 or 39, he realized that maybe he was supposed to be a deliverer for his people. So he shows up one day, and he sees this Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew brethren, or relatives, or Hebrews, right? And so what he does is he looks around, and no one's looking, and he kills the Egyptian. And he buries the Egyptian, 
right? And if, if you want more context, you go to the book of Acts, and it, and it gives us a really good story that Moses was like, oh, no, I'm here to do more than just be an Egyptian. He chose to be identified with people of slavery over royalty. So he was there to defend and to protect, right? And then the next day he comes out and he sees two Hebrews fighting, which he thinks is ridiculous, right? Why are you fighting each other? And they said, who made you ruler and judge? And then he finds out that Pharaoh found out that he killed someone. So now Pharaoh was after him. So Moses runs off into the wilderness. He ends up at this place where there is this well, and there's some ladies there trying to, trying to get their water for their flock, and these shepherds show up, and they run them off. Well, Moses is naturally a defender and a fighter, so he stands up for these ladies and scares off the shepherds. He must have been a really big dude or something, you know? So he just runs, runs them off, and because of that, he gets invited to live with Jethro, and Jethro says, here's my daughter, and then he has two kids. And so we find in Exodus chapter 3, 80 years, give or take one or two years, that Moses had been born. 40 years since he had left Egypt. And we step into a man that was living his life, his routine kind of life, right? And God shows up and God encounters him. Let's read here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, or we believe Mount Sinai. There, the angel of the Lord appeared appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, although the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, well, I'll go over and see this strange sight, which I think I would too, right? Why doesn't this bush burn up? And when the Lord saw, I love this, when the Lord saw that he had his attention, he'd gone over to look, and God called to him from the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. Now, side note, this isn't the first time God calls somebody by their name twice. God did it with Samuel. God did it with Abraham. Actually, Jesus the Christ did it in the New Testament. It was just an urgency. I have an urgent message for you. So he says, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And verse 5, he says, don't come any closer, God said. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac. And at this, Moses hid his face. Because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen, or I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned, or I know about their suffering. So I have come down. God comes down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good, spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the uh, Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, all those ites that live in the land. All right? And verse 9, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, has reached God. And God says, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Verse 10, So now... Go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What we find is a man who once thought his life would be different. We find a man that's in his routine, just going about his normal day life. He has responsibility, right? He has a good job. I mean, he works for his father-in-law. I don't know if that's a really good thing to do to work for your father-in-law. It's a side joke, just between me and her. But, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. But anyway, he works for his father-in-law. He's married. He's got a couple of kids. I'm sure at this point of his life, he thought he'd be doing something different than tending sheep or goats. Maybe it's his past that keeps him from filling the calling or that burning desire. Maybe it's just time and distance in a different season of life that keeps him from fulfilling that calling or that burning that he had, that, that deliver spirit, that fighting spirit that he had. But whatever it was, we do know this, that God showed up, that God encountered Moses. He interrupted him 
to reveal who he is, to reveal his passion to Moses, and to reveal his plan. See, Moses had an encounter with God. It's my desire today that when you leave here, that you have the same encounter with God. It's my desire today for some of you, when you leave here for the first time, you get to see who God is, like Moses did. And for others of you, there might be a season of life that you've passed you by, and maybe you've got caught up in the routine of life, and you're just going about life. And God's like, hey, I want to encounter you this morning because I want you to be involved in the plan that I have in my passion. And the same wording and the same way God encountered Moses, I want him to encounter you today. First, let's look at the purpose for this encounter. First, we see when God encounters Moses, or when he interrupts Moses, he reveals himself to him, right? Moses is tending the sheep, right? He's out there, or, or the, maybe it could be goats, and he sees this bush on fire. Now, I meant to look this up, and I completely forgot to look this up, but when I was in Sunday school, I was told that this was kind of normal, that a bush could catch on fire in the desert. If you're familiar with that kind of living, and I like to talk to you because I want to know if that's true, or if maybe my Sunday school teacher was just lying to me or something, but, you know, evidently the burning bush wasn't that really big of a deal. What made it a big deal was that the bush was not burning up. It was not consuming, and that's what made him go near. But listen, this wasn't just an ordinary bush. Look, in, look at verse, uh, I think it's verse 3 or verse 2. It says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames from within the bush. Now, we think of angel, right? We think of Gabriel maybe coming to, coming to uh, Mary, or maybe we think of uh, Joseph and the encounter that we have when we think of the word angel. Maybe it's Michael fighting you know, Satan over the bones of Moses. Maybe that's what you picture. Or some of you may picture Ezekiel, the vision that he had with all the eyes of the angels and stuff, and it looks really, really crazy. Listen, the angel really it just means messenger. It, it means um, our, the word of the Lord. But here, we don't have an angel that we would think of. We actually have something that we call different. Here's a theological term for you. We call it a Christophany. Right? A Christophany is the manifestation of the pre-incarnated Christ. Now, because I used a big word, I used big words in the definition to make it seem like I was smart. So, right? so the Christophany is the manifestation of the pre-incarnate. Or in other words, this is Jesus that we know of in the New Testament making an appearance in the Old Testament. Now, for you, this may be new to you. You may not know that Jesus was involved, or Christ, let's be clear, Christ. He's called Jesus the Christ. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one, the sent one, right? So we have Christ appearing in the Old Testament. This isn't the first time he appeared. We have a Christophany with Abraham. We have one with actually Haggai, you know, the mother of Ishmael, right? He shows up and speaks to her. We see Jacob Right? Jacob is fighting this, fighting God in the flesh, right? And he says, he won't let go until you bless me. That's a Christophany that we see. We see it, one of my favorite is where, you know where the donkey talks? You guys know that story? Right? The donkey begins to speak and stuff, right? And the donkey wouldn't move past the, past the barrier with Balaam on it, and, and, you know, then he curses him, right? That was a Christophany. That was Christ. Joshua experienced a Christophany. When, before he went to the battle of Jericho, he stood, and there's this angel, it says, of the Lord, and he says, who are you? He goes, I'm the captain of the armies of the Lord. And he goes, well, whose side are you on? He goes, well, I'm on nobody's side. He said, but take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. And there he was standing before the pre-incarnated Christ, right? Before him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fire, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, didn't we throw three in there, but now there's four? A Christophany. See, God, Jesus, or Christ, was very, very involved in the Old Testament. When John describes this Christ, Right? What does he do? In the beginning, he says, in the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then he says in verse 14 of the same passage, and he goes, and we beheld, and when the Word became flesh, we beheld him. Right? John says, I saw him, 
I talked to him. I touched him. He is the eternal word. He is the existing word. He is God. He is Jesus. He's the second head, or the second person of the Godhead, and he was involved in humanity. In fact, what John says is that he created all things, right? When we read in Genesis 1-1, we're like, wait, God created all things. Well, John says, let me, let me explain it to you. Jesus was a part of that creation. He created all things. In fact, Paul says that he created it, right? And he's the sustainer of it, right? He is the light of the world. And because of his light, man has life. Listen, what was true for Moses is true for you and I. When you have an encounter with God, the encounter always begins with Jesus the Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He tells Thomas, he goes, when Thomas says, show us the Father and it will suffice me, he goes, whoa, haven't I been with you long enough? He goes, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father, right? One of my favorite things is the I am statements of Jesus, right? If you were to continue to read this passage, God would identify himself as the I am, Yahweh. And Jesus and John recorded seven times that I am. He is the bread of life. He's the living water. Jesus is the manifestation of God. And when he took on flesh, and listen, by taking on flesh, he lowered himself a little lower than the angels, right? And he took on the form of a servant, which is humanity. And he did that for you and I, because he became the mediator for you between God and, and between God and yourself, because he's 100% God and he's 100% man. And if you are going to encounter God, you have to encounter him with Jesus Christ. Some of you, you're in your normal routine, right? You're going about your normal life. Things are good. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, this morning is an opportunity for you to encounter the Savior, to encounter Jesus Christ, to put your trust and faith in what Jesus has done for you. Because until you do that, you won't encounter God. Because you have to encounter him through Jesus Christ. That was the purpose, right? That was the purpose, all right, of God encountering Moses. Now we get to see the passion that he has. So actually, I skipped a couple parts, didn't I? I did skip a couple parts. Let me, let me hit this real quick, all right? Um, because when he revealed himself to him, right? In the next verse, he says, don't come any closer to me, right? When God reveals himself to Moses. I think this is one of, the, one of the most important parts of the message. So when God says, don't come any closer, right? He said, don't come any closer. He says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is what? Holy ground, right? See, this is the first time that we see the holiness of God or the word holy put towards God in the Bible. Now, if we look in the Genesis, we'll recognize that God is holy and God is set apart. But what does that mean, right? Holy means to be set apart. Holy means to be separate. I also like to believe it and look at it and take it a step further, believe that there's no evil intent in God. God is holy. So what God is telling Moses, he said, wait, wait, you need to stop where you're at because I am holy and there is this separation because of my holiness, right? There's this separation. Now, if you made God, right, you wouldn't make him holy, right? If you made God, you'd make him just like the, uh, the Israelites did when they made the golden calf. Or you would do it with wood, or you'd do it with stone, right? If you made God, it'd be a God that you can comprehend. It'd be a God that, that you can dictate. It'd be a God that, that you, can, um, you can say, well, God, you're going to do this because you're my God, and if you don't show up, then you're not my God. Like, it's a buffet style. Listen, God is not that way. God is set apart from you. God is holy, right? God is holy. When you come to God, right, you have to recognize his holiness, right? And he says this, he goes, take, he goes, take off, or he says, don't get me closer, but listen, when God invites you, when God looks at you and says, hey, I am holy, the next step is that he invites you into his presence. So he tells him, for the, take off your sandals. Now, what does that mean? I've read a couple commentaries, and it says this, 
with the removal of the shoes is a confession of personal defilement and consciousness, unworthy to stand in the presence of unspotted holiness. Another one said the removal of sandals was and still is in the east a sign of humility and reference in the presence of the Holy One. It was a way of excluding the dust and the dirt off the world, but it also took away any personal comfort and convenience and brought the person more closely in contact with the earth. In this case, the holiness of God. See, God is revealing to Moses that I am separate. I am inviting you into my presence. And in order for you to be invited in my presence, then you have to become holy. The ground is an example, right? Before then, he takes sheep and goats and they're passing through it. It's, a, it's an ordinary ground. But when God shows up, it becomes a holy ground, right? And when you come to the place of where you've encountered Jesus, you are invited into the presence. And now you yourself will be holy, set apart for his service. James says it this way. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you, right? Moses approaches, God comes near. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We have to get rid of the filth and the dirt in our life. Grieve and mourn. Change your laughter of the morning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. God is holy. The only way to come into his presence is through humility, is by removing the filth and the dirt in our lives. God also revealed to him his identity. We're going to hit this one really quick. He said in uh, verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So why would he say that, right? What would, what would that mean to Moses at that time? Well, God, when he came to Abraham, he made a covenant with Abraham. Right? And he made this covenant, and it's based on him. It's based on God. Right? He puts him to sleep. There's all these animals. It's really cool. Cool story. Go read it in Genesis. Right? But it, the covenant is based on God. So God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you by all people. I'm going to give you this land, this promised land. This is yours. This is a covenant I'm making with you. Then he makes, he reinforces it with Isaac and with Jacob. So what God is, what God is telling Moses, he goes, I'm the God of the covenant. I am the God of promise. And for Israelite who's in slavery, right, who's in oppression, for them to say, oh, that's the God that showed up to my fathers and now he is speaking to me. It takes, and they finally have relief. They can finally have hope because he's a God of promise. He's the God of covenant, and he's the God of their fathers. And it's because of this covenant, if we were to read in chapter 2, we'd see that God showed up because of the covenant. That's why we see God's passion. So now we see the passion for this encounter. In verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians. I love those those words because God sees and God hears. God is concerned, but then God gets involved, right? God comes down and God's going to rescue and he's going to provide life for his people, right? We get a picture of, of God. We get the picture of the God who sees and hears and knows. That means he's not a distant God. That means he's not an uninvolved God. He is a God who delivers. He's a God that comes down to deliver the rescue of his people from the oppressions of the Egyptians. And you know, this is a picture of misery and, and affliction and oppression. This is also the picture of sin and humanity, right? This is what sin does to mankind. It only hurts, it destroys, it brings death. And the same reason why God would come down to rescue his people from Egypt is the same reason he sent Jesus to rescue mankind from sin. God's passion, God's passion for lost people like you and I that were once lost, his passion, he is driven to, to work on the behalf of his creation because of sin. 
Remember when Eve, Adam and Eve fell and they sinned, right? They tried to create a covering, but the covering wasn't good enough. So God steps in, sheds blood and gives them the proper covering because he wants them to have the proper covering because it's only through the blood, right? Remember with Noah and the ark, right? It's a crazy story. And sometimes we're like, whoa, God destroyed the human race. But it says that every thought was evil and wicked continually. And so God looks down and he sees all the, the wickedness that's going on and all the unrighteousness that's going on. And then he sees Noah and he sees the grace. He finds grace in Noah. Noah is the righteous one. And so he looks down and he rescues Noah from that because he's going to be a God that's involved in rescuing his people from the effects of sin. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came because God is passionate about his creation and the effects of sin. And so when Jesus comes, Jesus, remember what he said, right? He said, I didn't come. I I came to seek the loss, right? It's the sick that need a physician. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you, right? Jesus said, I came so that you can believe in the name of the Son of God, for God sent his Son, right? God loved you so much. And while you were sinners, while you were against God, God sent Jesus to die for you. God's passion is for lost people, is for people in this world that doesn't know Jesus. And that takes us to the third part, the plan of his encounter, right? We see that God reveals himself, right? The purpose of the encounter is to reveal himself. And we see that God's passion is because his people are in slavery. They're oppressed, right? And now we see the plan for his encounter. The plan is in verse 10. He says this, so now go. Now go, Moses. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What is God's plan? God's plan is simple. Moses is to be an instrument in delivering God's people from the Egyptians. You know, God's plan is still the same for today, right? This world doesn't know Jesus. They're lost in their sin. But God's plan is still for you and I to be the instruments, to be a people to bring this world to Jesus. You and I are like Moses, right? God says, now go. I send you. I choose you. If you're a believer in Jesus, then Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 should mean something to you. It's called the Great Commission, right? What did God say? God said that, go ye into all the world, right? Go and teach them. What else did Mark say? Mark said, go in and preach the gospel. Remember in Acts, Luke is writing Acts, and he gets to verse 1, verse 8, or chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other other most parts of the earth. God's instrument, God's plan for a lost and dying world is for his believers to be his hands and his feet, to be his mouthpiece, to be the ones that go out. Paul says, how can they hear unless someone is sent? If you're going to encounter God today and you're a believer with God, if you are not telling others and sharing the gospel, then today is the day for you to say, you know, Mike, I'm going to start being a part of the passion of God, and I'm going to start being a part of the plan of God. We don't have time, but if we were to read from here, verse 11, all the way to chapter 4, verse 17, we'd see that Moses gave God five uh, objections. Five, right? I wish I could tell you. It'd be so beautiful if in verse 11, Moses said, yep, I'm going. Sign me up. I'm doing it. But that wasn't Moses, right? Moses was like you and I, which I appreciate, right? I like that when I can read a story and I go, yeah, that's probably more like me. Two of those objections really don't apply to us. It's more about to the Israel elders and, you know, is he really sure that God is speaking to him? But three of them, I, I think they do apply to us. I think I know I've struggled with this, and I have said this. First thing Noah said was, who am I? Right? Who am I to do your plan, God? Who am I to go before Pharaoh? Who am I to go help be the instrument to deliver your people? Right? Who, who am I? You know what God's answer was? Well, Moses, I'm with you. Right? I love that, because you know Jesus, one of some of the last things he said to his disciples? He says, lo, I'm with you, even unto the end of the world. 
Jesus is like, they're going to hate you. The world's not going to like you, right? Can you imagine signing up to follow Jesus after that? Hey, the world hates me. They're going to hate you. Some of you are going to probably die. You know, good luck. No, Jesus is like, no, no, listen, I'm with you. I go with you. I have all authority. And because Jesus is with you and because he goes before you, you're able to follow the plan and follow the passion that God has for this world. So that was the first one that he said. The second one, he says, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I don't speak well. I don't speak good. And in other words, I'm not qualified. And I think that's what hangs up a lot of people with sharing the gospel with others or living out the purpose in their life that God's called them. They don't feel like they're qualified. You don't feel like you're good enough. Listen, God equips the call, right? God is the one. And God told Moses, he goes, don't I make the, don't I make the mouth? He goes, I'll teach you and I will help you, right? You know, the disciples that followed Jesus, they weren't the ones that anybody else would have picked to follow them. They were fishermen, right? Some of them lawyers, a tax collector, right? But because they spent time with Jesus, what was the testimony in Acts? It's because they, spent, they knew that these men who were common men spent time with Jesus by the way they behave, by the way they act. Listen, if you walk with Jesus and you go with Jesus, he's going to teach you, he's going to guide you, he's going to lead you. Don't ever think you're not qualified to fulfill the passion and the purpose that God has in your life. Because God equips the call. The last one was Moses said, send someone else. Send someone else. Today, I hope that's not you. I hope you aren't in the place where you go, God, just send somebody else. Just let somebody else do it. I believe today that there are some of you sitting out here and you can identify with Moses your routine is not bad. Your life is good. You have purpose. You have meaning. But you feel limited from the role that God wants you to play in his kingdom. Whether it be your past mistakes. Can I just say something real quick about past mistakes? Satan uses past mistakes to keep you where you're at. Right? We all have a history. We've all made bad decisions. I mean, Moses killed a man. Right? Moses killed an Egyptian and hid his body. You know, Paul killed Christians, but yet God still reached down and said, I am going to use you. Your past does not eliminate you from the service of God. When you bring it to God, right, your past can be a testimony to others. It could be a light to where you have been. Don't allow your past to be an excuse because God does not allow that to be an excuse. Maybe you hesitate because it's distance. Maybe that was another season for another life and now you're in this season of life and you're like, yeah, it's probably not going to happen. Maybe, maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe that's what you're feeling today. But today, listen, I want you to allow God to encounter you. I want you to allow God to interrupt your normal life to do, to fulfill his passion and his plan. Remember, his passion is for people that are lost and that are separated from him to rescue people, and his plan is for you to go. Today, I want you to say, God, I want to say yes to you. I want to say yes to your plan. I'm going to follow after your passion. Now, some of you today... You don't know Jesus. And I touched this just a, a little bit. For you to know God, you have to come through Jesus. And God would love nothing more than to encounter you today and bring you into a personal relationship with who he is. Wherever you are and wherever season of life you're in, I hope and I pray that you will allow God to speak to you, that you allow God to move your heart and that you'll leave here as a person that says, yes, Lord. Or maybe like Moses said in verse 4, here am I, Lord. What are your objections? What is keeping you away from saying yes to God? What is your objections to Jesus? What's keeping you from saying yes to Jesus? What are those objections? Now's the time for you to deal with them. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. So Exodus, I love the book of Exodus because Exodus is about how God takes his people from oppression 
and leads them and, and takes them across the Red Sea. You know, the Red Sea was a big thing, a big, big uh, body of water that kept them from going forth, but it was God who split that Red Sea. And so my desire today is that if you have an objection that we just talked about, like Moses, that you allow God to split that for you. My desire is that today you, in the quietness of your heart, that you say, God, I struggle with following your plan and your purpose in my life. I struggle with sharing Jesus with others and just talk to him. If you were in Sunday study today, you would have known that we could come boldly before the throne of grace, right? We can come before, we come boldly before our high priest. God's not going to shut you down and God's not going to turn you away. God wants to invite you into his presence. Now, if you don't know Jesus, this is my last call to you. This is the day. This is the day for you to call out to him. You're separated from God because of your sin. But God sent Jesus to rescue you. You don't have a relationship with God because of sin. But God sent Jesus to rescue you. And today's the day that you call to Jesus. You say, God, forgive me of my sins. I'm going to make you Lord of my life because of what Jesus has done for me. If you want to know more about that, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for what you've done. God, the book, your Bible has all these wonderful stories, and we can apply them so well to our life. God, for those out here that are ready to encounter you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in their heart. I pray, God, that you will allow them to break down those objections. I pray that you will allow them to get on their knees, and I pray that they will say yes, Lord, to you. Father, for the one that doesn't know you, Help them today to see the truth. Help them to see the light. Help them to see that you're a God that loves and cares and you've come down to rescue. Be with us this week, Lord. Please guide us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.